People should know what goes on behind the scenes in this institution because it's working. It's changing the culture of how we deliver what we do. It's changing our patients' attitude towards healthcare. It's a choice we've made to change healthcare starting with ourselves. What's her diagnosis? She has um, bone cancer. And her age? 26. 26. And she the problem is that healthcare is perceived as chaotic, confusing, cumbersome, impersonal. It's a scary place to be. People are afraid. You often hear them say, I'm afraid to go to the hospital for all those reasons. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be what we're trying to do here at Sharp. Personal, caring. It should be a transition that's smooth, that you feel like you're being helped through something instead of shoved through something. And how we're doing that is a Sharp experience. And simply that is to treat people the way you'd like to be treated. You know, I'd rather put her on an oncology floor. I was thinking, if they're not very busy over there, she needs a lot of attention. What does she? She's really very repressed. Needs a lot of, a lot of TLC. Okay. Oh, I like that attitude. Hey, Terry, it's Colleen. Um, listen, in SI, I have a 26-year-old, and she requires a lot of personal time. Okay, we've got 10-minute ETA on the major trauma victim, fall victim, head injury. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. I give good care. I'm compassionate. I go out of my way to make people feel comfortable. I treat people like I would want to be treated. Kim, 100 cc's in. So like I would want him to treat my husband or my mom and my dad. So now I have a name for what I do anyway, and it's the Sharp Experience. Will you ask him who we can call for him, family members? They're going to remember that you brought them a straw for their water. They're going to remember that you gave their loved one a cup of coffee. Or they might even remember that you fed their loved one along with them because you wanted the family to eat together. Those are the things people remember about health care. Hi, this is Colleen. Can I help you? Hey, Lori. You know, I think one of the most important things to remember is that these just aren't patients with diagnosis. Each of these people is a mother or a sister or a father or a brother, and they all have a story and a face, and that's where it comes down to a very personal individual relationship that we have. Every one of us that touched that patient. I don't want to take a nap. There's too much going on. It was um, April 10th, 2001, and I woke up um, Woke up in my bed, walked down the hall, actually got to this place right here and passed out. Knew I was fading and just laid down. No chest pains, no, nothing. Just, I felt weird when I got up, but I didn't have pain. So I just laid down on the floor and waited for it to go. Every, I had all the kids here, everybody was sleeping. She had a very complicated problem uh, where she had her coronary arteries dissect. That's a process where the layers of the coronary arteries separate and block blood flow to the heart. And she'd also had some of the arteries that go to her brain uh, had also separated the uh, layers like the coronary arteries on her heart had. But we got her through all that and then um, uh, with the heart pump eventually sent her home with the hopes of finding her a um, heart transplanter. Carolyn currently has a heart mate left ventricular assist device. This is it right here. It sits right on top of her stomach inside. This part here is sewn up into the left ventricle. And then there's a long Dacron graft like this that attaches to her aorta. Nobody else in the county has this type of technology to be able to support them and send them home. The thing I saw was the vent, which is right there. I saw that, and I'm like, what the heck is that? And they, wouldn't, they didn't tell me for a little while. And then finally they told me what had happened. And, and I said, well, I'll just get a new heart, right? Okay, so cheesy. Cheesy. And with Carolyn, she's unique in that she really never had any heart problems before this event happened to her. So when she woke up, you know, one day she was a, a normal mom taking care of her children, and she woke up 
after this event and said, what, what is going on? Well, your heart failed and you have a new heart pump. If we did not have this sort of advanced exotic, I guess you could call it technology available here, then there would be a certain number of patients that uh, would, not, would not survive. You got to have surgeons, you got to have the nurses at the bedside. In, from the surgical ICU to the step down to the home health nurses. We use our rehab. Um, we're the only rehab hospital in the country that um, takes left ventricular assist devices. The staff out there has all been trained. They know how to manage them. The most important thing for human existence though is to be outside of the hospital. And so uh, we've been pioneers in, in getting people home with heart devices. We are sort of uh, a community resource in that regard. And there are pumps that we're going to be starting to test in the very near future that are about the size of your thumb that actually fit in the tip of the heart. And they are a product uh, sort of the aerospace industry. And I'm not like my, my father who's an engineer. I'm not, I don't need to know all of that. You know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I don't necessarily need to know why. Is that spiky enough for you? Huh? No. No. Not yet. Not yet. No. I try and do everything I can. I collapse at about 7 o'clock, though. Mm -hmm. And then I try and make it through bath time. My mother died when I was 17, so the first time I ever went to a funeral was my mo own mother. It was horrible. It's about how you're going to make it, because you got to be here. <laughs> you don't have a choice. you got to make it. So. When they're at home on the first phone call, if they have a problem, um, and, and so you do get an attachment to all of these patients. It's, you can't, how can you not? She continued to do well with her children at home. Riley grew to be a year or so old. And then she came in with uh, pump failure in the case of these heart pumps. If a bearing is carrying a load at 70 uh, beats per minute, 60 minutes an hour and 24 hours a day, and then 365 days a year, that gets to be a lot of beats. So about a week ago, we uh, changed her pump. She came in in the hospital for about a week. We changed her pump, and now she's uh, back home. Well, we knew it was time. It was really bad. We got every beat out of that last pump that we could, but uh, it just needed to be replaced. Yeah. How about your incisions? How are they doing? Fine. And out. And The transplant coordinator is involved in helping patients go through the transplant process. As a matter of fact, I got called on you the other night. It was from Denver, Colorado. Yeah. It was actually last night at 12.28 in the morning. <laughs> what did they do? Well, they, they call Sharp and they say that we have a heart offer for you. And uh, they call the coordinator on call, which was me. So what, what happened? Is, uh, I had to turn it down. But you can't match it? Because they couldn't do a cross match. Right. And she absolutely needs, needs one. Support, right? Yeah. Because of the blood transfusions that she'd received and her three children, she is uh, allergic to most hearts. This area is people that are waiting, and this area is all the patients that have been transplanted. These are just our heart transplant patients. Pretty lucky, because <laughs> there's lots of people that don't qualify to get a heart. There's lots of people that don't qualify to get a pump. So I think that the fact that I have both, both of those things going for me, I'm, a lot more fortunate than many people. I get to live. <laughs> Just from little Riley's perspective, he started out at zero and is now about a year and a half or so. And if he's four or five and at the extreme, let's just say, Carolyn has a transplant then and continues on until he goes to college or whatever. I mean, that's what we have to do into the future. So, I don't know, we'll have to say, yeah, but you know, she's. That's not long enough. You know, I want to... My daughter would be only 23 years old. I mean, that's not long enough for me. I want to see more than that. I want to be here longer than that. When I was four years old, I wanted to be a doctor, and that has never changed. Even though I see patients in my office, a key thing is trying to prevent patients from actually coming to my office in the first place. And one way of doing that is to go out to the sites to find out what they do, so I can give input to prevent injuries. How much is this one here? 47 pounds. 
You can see a back injury coming out of that. Yeah. At least it was my back. He turns at kind of a weird angle, and then he has to step off what it's talking about a two foot drop. Didn't turn that, and then he has constant air the whole time. Ladder coming through. On days like this, I'm working to keep people out of my office. Fourteen thousand strong. The Sharp Experience story is being brought to you in the spirit of community service by Sharp Healthcare. Sharp provides San Diego's most comprehensive care. Sharp's over 2,500 affiliated physicians include the primary care doctors and specialists of the Sharp Community Medical Group, Sharp Mission Park Medical Group, and Sharp Reese Staley Medical Group. The physicians of Sharp Healthcare can be accessed through almost all health insurance plans. For more information, talk to a nurse at 1-800-82-SHARP or visit sharp.com. We really all are on the same track. I mean, we all think the same thought, and once again, schmaltzy as it is, we want the best thing for the people we're caring for, and that comes through time and time again. I mean, we'll talk about something, and then the bottom line to all of us will be, well, what's the best thing for the patient? Excuse me again. Hi, this is Colleen. Can I help you? Hi, Mrs. Watt. How's your walking coming along? Great, great. Stuff that seems to be common sense. You know, you should be grateful to people for what they do. You should have a good attitude. You How should you say today? nice things. You should make your words work. They would ask me so many times, is there anything else I can get you? Can I get you this? Can I get you water? Can I get you, can I close this curtain for you? Or would you like this curtain open or this door open or closed? I get all of that from them, from each and every one of them, not just certain ones. All of them do the same thing. When you see patients, greet them with a smile. Say hello and say, can I help you? If they have that look on their face like, where am I? They're in a strange building, they don't know where to go. You need to direct them. You need to take them to where they need to go. Ah, so, oh, no, 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 girlfriend. <laughs> Breathe for me, chica. Ow. And we check the end seats all out. Okay, good. You're a grown-up. You did good. <laughs> Treat the patient as a whole not just as a, an abdomen or a hysterectomy, uh, but as a whole person. Emotions uh, play a big, big part in your healing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you think you can do it, you can. We'll get some stuff. Knock, knock. If you've Bye. been a patient yourself, uh -huh. you ready to get up and play? Yeah. Cool. You know what it feels like to be on the other side of the sheets. It comes back to caring. How would you feel if you were the patient? You drop them over and sit. That's my girl. Breathe, breathe, breathe. A family member will come on up to you and say, we couldn't have done it without you, or you made all the difference. And it does make you realize that what you're doing is a good thing. It's true, sometimes in the ER we're too busy to be able to do anything, but when I stop I'll ask them right before I leave the room, is there anything else I can do for you? Because I have time. It, maybe I don't have much time, but right now when I'm with them, I want them to know that right now they are my patient and they're the most important person to me. We're proud of what we do because we feel good about it. We're continually reinforced that what we're doing is the right thing to do. And it trickles all the way down, all the way through the system. Here's one of our behavior standard posters right here. And every month we take on a new standard. And one of them from a couple months ago was to thank somebody. And I'm going to take you and show you some examples of that here. To have someone who's five levels above you who might have heard of something you did send you send you a card or come up to you and say you know I heard you did this it was really really wonderful you did that and important what a huge difference it makes what an affirmation of what you're doing is right so, <laughs> I'm Dr. UC Poconos you know what that is it's a black eye you know what <laughs> I'm V. Jewel, and I'm a clown escort. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is a stool specimen here. And they sent it down to the laboratory, and they love that. So. <laughs> there is reason to believe that if you have a happy attitude, that you do heal better, and I, I believe that. <laughs> hey, you got a great laugh. <laughs> Laughter is the best medicine. That's why I have the light in my nose. <laughs> 14,000 Strong, the Sharp Experience story is being brought to you in the spirit of community service by Sharp, a healthcare organization designed not for profit, but for people. Contributions to the Sharp Foundation support new state-of-the-art facilities vital to a healthy future for San Diego.
Physicians, employees, and volunteers of SHARP have proudly donated nearly $8 million toward the SHARP Foundation's current fundraising efforts. To learn how you can help us make a difference, call 1-800-82-SHARP or visit SHARP.com. There's a change that's going on, and it's a slow little revolution there, but you do feel it. And we see it in our outcomes. You can see that it actually makes a difference. There is a lot of evidence that it's very important for the patient to have family support. It improves the outcome, also makes the experience less difficult, because it's always difficult, no matter what. We have a patient, Mr. Lopez, here in the ICU, and he became very confused after his operation. And uh, it was very important for him to have his family next to him thanks to the good nursing care and the family next to him it really got him through and he's much better now. We're probably going to get you to another room today. Okay. It's what we call patient-centered care, which we allow the family to stay at the bedside, be with the patient 24 hours a day. I'm here. I can sit for myself. I can hear her breathe. I know she's all right. And then she can ask me anything she wants at any time. She was born in 1903. Makes her 100 years old. I told her that Spencer and Miles were coming up. Oh, good, I want to see them. She broke her hip, and we do want to make sure that she's comfortable with her surroundings and gets home as soon as possible. Because everybody is the same. Everybody loves their relatives, and everybody wants to be involved in their care. You know, we've been planning this ICU for over six years, and we did a lot of research on the involvement of families in patient care because before it used to be, you know, the ICU, the patients and the nurses and the families were on the outside. And you can see that the rooms are so much larger. The privacy is just fabulous. When we were so tired tonight, we just, there is, there's no way we're going to let grandmama by herself. No, we've, we've got to be there with her. It, it, it's really easy because it, it just pulls out like this. That, that was a huge surprise today when we were told actually that uh, we'd get to spend the night with her if we wanted to. So we just grabbed the opportunity right there. It was wonderful. Yeah, it's really actually comfortable. <laughs> How can you say no? I mean, it's so much better than just being on the chair. Good night. You know, I have some favorite nurses here. Karen, Edna, Norma, they're all really nice. There's one nurse taking care of two patients. So the cubicle is right in the middle of the two rooms and through the windows they can sit down, do their paperwork and watch their patients at the same time. Which is a big thing. I mean, after being a nurse for 30 years, you know, you get to recognize certain looks. If their blood pressure is starting to fall or something's not quite right, you go in and check it out. And actually, we also have some little monitors. They can find you anywhere you are in the unit. And then we have a monitor here at the desk that tells us where every nurse is. Real high tech. Her son, my father, came in at the same time. And so she just jumped oh, and grabbed him around the neck, even with the IV in her arm and everything. And then, of course, she just holds on to us, like she always does. She always grabs your hand and won't let go. All my grandkids, and they're wonderful kids, wonderful. They're always there when you need them. She's pretty tough. She'll get better. Not just pretty, but strong. She has a beautiful family, and uh, we all try to do our best for her because she's precious. Very precious. I'm so proud to be their grandmother. I'm going to stay her grandmother. <laughs> Not going to change. Being with all this technology right now, I think the most important thing is the human touch. We should not forget that it's the number one need, the human touch. If everybody didn't do what their own particular job was, then the patient wouldn't get the full care. And, um, you know, I'm a housekeeper, but it's an important job. You know, I have to keep the patient rooms clean and, and help them with the smaller things that I can help them with. Because every morning when I leave the house, I always say a little prayer that God would help me to be a good housekeeper for my unit, for myself, and for God. And I do my best. I have to believe it's every employee's job to have the right attitude. And you get the attitude by working in a place you're proud of, you're proud to be a part of, you're glad to come to work. This is my hospital, um, and I believe that. I believe that everybody here is an extension of my family as far as the people I work with. I like coming in with a positive attitude. I like coming in knowing that, uh, that um, I make a difference. I love my job. There's times where I go home, I feel beat up, but I feel satisfied. But I can't wait to come to work the next day and start with a clean slate and start all over again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thurman. That's what I want.
just want to say hello. I think everybody's eyes perked up when she came in. Would you like a visit from the therapy dog? Oh, yes. Hi, there. Hey, there. Hi, Yeah. They're friendly. They accept you for who you are. They don't talk bad. <laughs> She's got so much love. And she's so cute. And the outfits that she comes in are all one in a million. I schedule my treatment around Kara. Kara, our therapy dog, is a symbol for what we stand for here at Sharp Healthcare. 14,000 employees, physicians, and volunteers who are dedicated every day to making a difference in your healthcare experience, making it the very best it can possibly be. We can't put every one of these individuals in this show but I would like to thank each of them from the bottom of my heart for everything you do to make a difference in your patients' lives. Thank you. 14,000 strong, the Sharp Experience story will continue. Sharp is a healthcare organization designed not for profit, but for people. And the cornerstone of the Sharp Experience is respect for those dedicated to caring and healing. If you are a nurse or clinical professional who shares our passion to transform the healthcare experience, we invite you to get to know us at Sharp, San Diego's healthcare leader. Call 1 800 82 Sharp or visit sharp.com. Sometimes healthcare is not about heroic acts, it's not about medicine and testing, not about new beginnings, about something entirely different. We're the only facility of its kind in Southern California. A hospice is about living. It is about caring for people with terminal illnesses, but making sure that they are living while we're caring for them. I have more happy memories of this place than I do sad memories, and I was watching my brother die the whole time. I've had many um, relatives say, when they come in here, they feel so comfortable. They go, man, Bob, this place is just like being at my grandma's house or my aunt's house. It was a safe place where I could feel like instead of fighting for the care that I knew Josh deserved, I could sit there beside my brother's bed and talk to him and just be with him. And that had been the first time in four and a half months that I'd been able to do that. I mean, that was a real gift. The first couple days when Bob kind of came on scene, the way that he talked to Josh was so, it just kind of melted my heart. So this would be now the um, second annual Josh Spaghetti Feast. It, I think it takes a really special person to do a job like this. Bob became a member of our family. We all felt that. I know I can speak for my father, too. Well, I thought um, it would be appropriate if I brought Josh's picture out here so he could join us. He was more than just a nurse to Josh, and he was more than just a nurse to us, too. People after the demise of the patient, the bereavement program that continues for a year or more. Clothing that you once would wear has now become my memory bear. I don't know, maybe you should read this. People are sending in, oh, maybe a sheet off the bed or grandma's favorite curtains or her dress and they're wanting um, memory bears made out of these important items. Sharp Hospice Care, the volunteers come in and make them and so diligently. I lost my mom in January, and then I lost my father um, just this May. One of the first reactions when you have your alone time with your bear, after you finally get it home, first thing we do is try and smell yeah. They're wonderful to hug when you have a grief burst. They're nice and soft. I hold you close and just think of you, smiling at me and hugging me too. It catches all my tears, and I love that. This little guy colored here is a former 24-week gestation infant who's well on his way to getting bigger and stronger and going home. Most of our babies are fed with breast milk. It's an ideal food. So it's a very simple process, just putting the milk into the feeding tube. So while this baby's getting this sensation of having food in the stomach and that comfort of being fed, we have the baby sucking on the pacifier and making that connection. They make the connection. Chances are, hopefully, they'll be better breast feeders or better bottle feeders, whatever the case may be. I'm Ivy's mom. 
Ivy is three weeks in a couple of days, but she was born at 27 weeks gestation. So she was early, anxious, anxious to get out. <laughs> this is the largest neonatal intensive care unit in the county and the second largest in the state. <laughs> Today we've got 48 intensive care babies. Like an older child and adult, they can't say, I don't feel good today, or I don't have any appetite. But the nurses will say, you know, this kid just doesn't look right to me today. Or, boy, when I bathed this baby today, he just wasn't quite as active as yesterday. I think there's something going on. And most of the time, they're right. Uh, well before any of our monitors can pick that up, well before any of our blood tests can pick that up, our nurses are alerting us to what's going on with the baby. Open your eyes. Oh, I'm sorry for startling you. Our three primary nurses are constantly interacting with us and we feel like we have an open line of communication. We really support family-centered care here and really believe that in order to care for our patients properly, we need to care for the whole family. And the parents are an integral part of what we do here. All right, kiddo. Let's see if I can feed you here. I'm allowed to change her diapers, take her temperature, help with her baths, um, and my favorite thing is what they call kangaroo care, and that's where you do skin-to-skin -skin contact holding your baby, and that's the best part. No matter how many great docs you have or how much wonderful equipment you have, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the occupational therapists, social workers are the heart and soul of the unit. Taking a very new, fragile life and nurturing that over a period of several months and then see the outcome when they come back is extremely satisfying. What a rewarding career. And they make such a difference. Outside of God, they're the most important people here.